All right. Good morning. Before Jillian starts, I want to be sure everybody knows that uh, Caleb Stephan is going to give his uh, talk on uh, media violence uh, again next Wednesday. Uh, I know those of you that were here last year heard it in January a year ago. Um, and I asked him to come back and do it again in view of uh, especially events that have occurred over the last year with the, in schools and so forth. But I want you guys to know it so that if there are people that you know in other disciplines, uh, pediatrics in particular, uh, that would, would maybe be interested in it, why well, invite them to come. Uh, we're, sending, we're sending letters to um, a lot of the pol politicians as well as uh, community leaders. So we may have a full crowd next, uh, next Wednesday. I hope we do. But just wanted you all to know that uh, that's up, up and coming next week. Okay, Jillian. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Scott. For those of you that don't, don't know me, maybe some of the medical students, I'm one of the surgery interns. And I'm going to be doing a case presentation on the highest node. Uh, and special thanks to uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Bell, and Dr. Moore for allowing me to participate in the case and the care of this patient. I have no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to give a case presentation uh, for a patient who presented to the A service, um, then talk about principles of surgical resection of colon cancer, types of regional lymphadenectomies, skip metastases, and then the uh, emerging role of sentinel lymph node mapping, and then followed by the staging and treatment of our patient. So CM is an 80-year-old African-American male. He presented to Dr. Moore um, after having a colonoscopy uh, by Dr. Kessler on 12-14. He was found to have a transverse colon mass near the hepatic flexure. Uh, they were unable to get past the mass. Uh, it was tattooed, and they took a biopsy that showed invasive adenocarcinoma. Um, his uh, symptoms were positive for unintentional weight loss, a loss of appetite, fatigue, change in bowel movements, and lightheadedness. His past medical history was significant for hypertension, GERD, type 2 diabetes, and uh, BPH. Um, his past surgical history was pretty unremarkable, uh, some minor surgeries as well as a prostate surgery. Uh, medications, he was on amlodipine, uh, finasteride, uh, lisinopril, and meprazole. Uh, his allergies were just to penicillin, and his social history was significant for a 34-pack year smoking history, uh, no alcohol or drug use. So he underwent some CT imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis on 12-29. Uh, it showed some wall thickening, inflammatory changes of the proximal transverse colon near the hepatic flexure, and they found a couple um, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. So this is our imaging. So right here, you'll see that's one of the enlarged lymph nodes they were talking about, that they were concerned about. As we scroll down, you can see a little bit further down. Here we go. So right around here is the wall thickening near the hepatic flexure. And then it's a little better seen the coronal sections. Sorry. Okay. So right here. All right. So he then preoperatively uh, got labs. He was anemic, which was a neat initially why he had presented for colonoscopy from his PCP, um, but otherwise uh, unremarkable labs. He uh, underwent an elective open right hemicolectomy with a sta stapled ileocolic anastomosis on the 17th of January. Um, the proximal margin was 10 centimeters proximal to the ileocecal valve. The distal margin was 10 centimeters distal to the tumor. And the mesentery was taken as proximal as possible with the ileocolic artery and vein being divided with suture ligatures. Uh, the, 
but then we were, uh, of course, examining, and a large one centimeter uh, firm lymph node was felt at the base of the middle colic artery, and it was removed separately from the specimen um, and sent for pathology. So here is our specimen. That's the appendix, ileum, ascending colon, transverse colon, Dr. Moore, and the mass. So. Uh, pathology came back. Um, the specimen showed a moderately differentiated colonic adenocarcinoma uh, that invades the pericolonic tissue. There were 13 lymph nodes which were taken that were all negative that were in the specimen. Um, they saw the appendix as well, and the surgical margins were negative. Um, then the lymph node that we called the highest node turned out to be positive uh, for metastatic adenocarcinoma, and it the pathologist reported that this, uh, these cells were similar to those found in the colon. So uh, to come away from our patient and kind of talking about surgical resection in colon cancer, uh, obviously we want to take out the tumor, uh, remove some major vascular pedicles, um, and then removing the lymphatic drainage basin. So Resection margins, um, distal and proximal margins, uh, should be at least five to seven centimeters from the tumor. Uh, Japanese literature says 10 centimeters. So, um, and then it was, um, I thought it was interesting, the length of ileum resected um, does not influence local recurrence rates, um, but it should also allow for resection of appropriate uh, segment of bowel with its vascular supply and lymphatics. So there's kind of two ways to do it. There's a malignant uh, malignancy versus a benign process when you're taking out the colon. Uh, so this is a malignant process. So um, in the right uh, hemicolectomy, um, you take it down closer here. And if it was not a malignant process, you would not need to go down as low because you wouldn't need the lymph nodes. Point out where the lymph node would have been there, Jillian. So uh, the lymph node was kind of at the base of the middle colic, so it okay. would have been down here. So in regional lymphadenectomy, um, it's considered you need a minimum of 12 lymph nodes to be adequate for staging, um, and approximately 23% of patients receive inadequate lymph node evaluation because they just don't have as many lymph nodes or, you know, you don't take enough. Um, and then... Uh, they actually did a systematic review um, that showed an association between increased lymph node evaluation and improved survival in patients that have node positive disease. Um, and they um, postulated that the effect of the increased lymph node recovery um, might not be fully explained just by staging and their, therefore their chemo afterwards, but might be more similar to uh, taking out kind of a met metastasis. So this is the Japanese uh, classification systems of lymphadenectomy. Uh, they have D1 through D4 excision. Um, I find it best to look at a picture. So the numbers are where they put the lymph nodes, but it's really more important the colors. So the red colors is a D1 excision. The blue is a D2 excision. And then the green ones are a D3 excision. So, and then in 2009, the term uh, complete mesocolic excision um, came to be. It's similar to that of a D3 lymph node dissection um, and requires proximal vascular ligation at the origin of the feeding vessels, but doesn't require uh, dissection of the root vessels. But it can also invi involve the central vascular ligation. It removes more, a radical, more radical removal of the lymph nodes. Uh, the main thing in this was that sharp dissection was what was important um, in the mesocolic plane, um, and that would theoretically improve your oncological outcome. <coughs> so uh, they perform performed a systematic review of complete mesocolic excision and found um, morbidity is 19.4 percent, mortality was 3.2 percent, um, and then their reoperative intervention rate for vascular complications, since they're taking more of the vascular supply, was only 1.1%, and these were all comparable uh, to standard resections. So. 
So they looked at the impact of vascular ligation on the survival of patients with colon cancer. Um, MITS to the central lymph node occurs about 1 to 8% of patients. Um, and then this study was saying that resection of the nodes may confer a, a survival benefit analogous to that of resection of metastasis at di distant sites. So their data support uh, basically a complete resection of the mesocolic envelope and ligation to at least the D2 level. But all of these are, you know, uh, retrospective studies, uh, and they feel like um, there needs to be a properly powered randomized controlled trial uh, for uh, routine excision of central D3 lymph nodes, and there is one of those ongoing um, that is started in 2016. So what I thought was interesting about this case uh, was that it uh, was a skip metastasis. So there was no lymph nodes that were um, positive in our specimen, even though we took an adequate amount. Uh, we had 13, um, but it felt a hard lymph node, uh, so took it out. And it turns out that this happens in less than 2% of cases. Um, but they started looking a little harder um, at the lymph nodes um, and using molecular techniques to uh, examine the lymph nodes to see if there are uh, micro metastases in there. Um, and it found it's closer to like 18 percent um, when you examine it with the molecular techniques. So, but when they compared it the normal way, just histopathological H and E staining alone, it was comparable to the 2 percent. So. Um, it kind of demonstrates that there may be a higher incidence of skip metastases um, than we had previously thought, and it kind of challenges the concept of the sequential. It goes through certain lymph nodes first. So they also uh, performed a study, um, a retrospective uh, study, to look at risk factors for lymph node skip metastasis. Um, and they found that actually smaller tumors, less than five centimeters, lower staging T1, T2 tumors, um, and N1 staging were all significantly associated with skip metastases. So it kind of appears that the smaller tumors may have uh, more of a predilection for, uh, for having skip mits. Um, so they concluded that the D3 lymphadenectomy should be standard practice. which then kind of bring, brought me to sentinel lymph node mapping. Um, so we don't do sentinel lymph node mapping. It's not a standard approach for colon cancer. Obviously, we do for breast cancer, melanoma. Um, the reason we don't is that uh, they found that they don't accurately predict the presence um, of nodal mets. Um, so there's a lot of false negatives, 4%, skip lesions, obviously, and uh, just failures to identify it in general. But there is some ongoing research about its utility um, and looking at it kind of a different way. Um, so this study, they used intraoperative uh, sentinel lymph node mapping um, that were undergoing just a standard resection. And they uh, looked at where um, the lymphatic drainage went, and they identified 22% uh, had aberrant lymphatic drainage, like that they would not have taken that out as planned and it changed their operative decision that they actually took more um, to include those lymphatics that it drained to. And then 10% had positive sentinel lymph nodes in the aberrant locations. And nodal, pos of note, nodal positivity was also higher in the patients who had a change of operation. So this is kind of how they do it um, with the ICG endocyanin green um, in the spy camera. So they injected it like two centimeters on each side um, of the cancer, um, and then they wait 20 minutes, um, and then they look for the lymph node, and then they mark it, and then they take it out. Just an anatomy review for medical students, the different layers. You have a mucosal layer uh, that has a muscularis mucosa, uh, a submucosal layer, uh, as well as a muscularis and a serosal layer. Uh, this is just important thinking about the layers because this is how the T staging works. Um, and then I like pictures with it. So in carcinoma in situ is in the mucosal layer. Uh, the T1 uh, staging is in the submucosa, uh, but not through the muscularis propria T2. Uh, 
is in the muscularis propria but not through it. Uh, T3 is, in the sub, uh, is through the muscularis propria, and then T4 is through the serosa and onto adjacent structures. And then lymph nodes, um, basically uh, the staging is uh, N0, there's none, N1, um, you have one to three, uh, and N2, you have four or more that are positive. And then metastasis, you don't have metastasis or you do have metastasis. And then there's, you know, under that, kind of defining where it goes. So for our patient, um, he had a T3 tumor um, initially with no nodes in his specimen. So he was uh, staged as a 2A. Uh, and then Bell reached his giant hand in there and pulled out the lymph node and turned it into a 3B. So what happened um, is for staging and treatment, that's important uh, because there is a big difference between stage two and stage three because you're talking about whether or not they receive chemo or not. Um, so uh, for stage three colon cancer, which is node positive disease, adjuvant chemo is beneficial. Uh, it has approximately a 30% relative reduction in the risk of recurrence um, and 22 to 32% relative reduction in mortality. So the types of adjuvant chemotherapy that are used are typically Fulfox um, or, you know, uh, Kepacitabine, uh, also known as Zolota, um, and Oxaliplatin, um, or you can just do Zolota alone. The problem is the benefits of adjuvant chemo in stage two disease are controversial. Um, there's a several trials out there and they fail to show unequivocal benefit. Um, so currently the idea is to use kind of their clinical and molecular features um, to kind of guide decision making. So the evidence is weak, but this is kind of how we do it. You'll notice that the pathology report actually did have um, whether or not he had mismatch repair enzymes. He did not have deficient mismatch repair enzymes. Um, if they have mycocyte instability, poor undifferentiated histology, or then obviously a T4 tumor, um, less than 12 lymph nodes, if you have inadequate lymph node um, uh, in your specimen, um, and then positive margins are all indications that they will potentially receive adjuvant chemotherapy. So Another interesting thing is that, so this is what he was initially without that one node, um, but if they receive inadequate lymph node harvest, uh, which is about 23% of patients, uh, those that, that had the inadequate lymph node, um, inadequate lymph nodes uh, who received adjuvant chemotherapy actually had an increased overall five-year survival of 78% versus 54%. So it is a significant survival advantage. Um, but what was interesting is only like 16% of patients that didn't have enough lymph nodes actually got the chemo. So in our patient, he was discussed in tumor board. The medial stinal lymph nodes were determined to be not suspicious for metastatic disease. He's being seen by Dr. Nagaretti in oncology, and he is actually taking the adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, he was prescribed three months of the Zolota. He was not re recommended to take oxaliplatin. Uh, Dr. Nagaretti uh, felt, uh, and in the oncology uh, literature, uh, says that there is a uh, no survival benefit um, or no significant benefit in patients over 70 years old, and he was 80 years old. So he is on his chemo. Uh, so cost of medicine, the ICG is what they use. Um, it's 50 milligrams for a vial. Actually only used 25 milligrams in the study that they did, um, so $25 for that. However, of course, you have to use the more expensive equipment, um, the SPI camera and all those things. So in conclusion, um, you know, complete mesocolic excision um, doesn't have increased morbidity or mortality over a D2 uh, dissection, um, and the current standard of care is to have, you know, a CME as well as ligation to at least the D2 level. Of course, of note, uh, speaking with Dr. Moore, uh, obviously uh, in cancer cases, a lot of times you take what the patient gives you. So um, that's important to note as well. So uh, with the use of molecular uh, techniques, it appears that skip mets are more common uh, and that they appear to happen at earlier stages. 
um, and that sentinel lymph node mapping is not the current standard of care, but it is an interesting concept and has interesting implications in how it can affect your operative decision making uh, to potentially improve uh, your, the care of your patient. And then, obviously, adequate lymphadenectomy is important uh, for staging and treatment of colon cancer, as we found in our patient. Any questions? Uh, would you have been able to identify this lymph node if you hadn't been doing it open? I, I guess Dr. Bell can answer that, but I don't think so. I think he and just I assume, felt I it. And you palpated this lesion and found it, and that's why you took it Yeah, up. he palpated it, said, this feels hard. I'm sorry? Okay, uh, yeah. Um, I don't think so either. I, you know, I took a look at this guy in the office, and you have to make decisions on when you're going to do something open, when you're going to do something laparoscopic. And in my opinion, uh, he was an open patient uh, from the beginning based on his body habitus and the look of the tumor and whether I thought I was going to get a decent dissection. But I would also believe that if we had done it with the laparoscope, we would not have palpated or seen that and simply finished the operation. And um, what I meant by sometimes you take what they can give you, Dr. Bell recently put seven trocars in a morbidly obese woman for six hours and with 12 centimeters of subcutaneous fat and there's no, we, we got a couple of lymph nodes less than we wanted to get, but we weren't going to get any better in that woman. Yes, Dr. Stanley. Yeah. Just some comments. This is a this is a an interesting topic, and it's, it's sometimes difficult to know what to do about it. And uh, this was more popular, like I think you mentioned, it was more popular early, maybe eight or nine years ago. There was a lot of activity around this. And you meant now by that you mean the extent of resection or the sentinel node? sentinel node? Yeah, the sentinel node issue. This extent of resection. Actually, there's been controversy in that because if you probably remember or some of us do back in the day, everything was a hemicolectomy. There wasn't segmental with five or 10 centimeter margins and that sort of thing. And then there was actually some studies. There's one large study out of uh, France where they did, they compared them prospectively, a segmental versus extended left and actually survival was better in the, the limited resection. It was thought because of the morbidity of the operation. But I think with surgical technique getting better, I don't know that people think of that so much as they do what you're talking about, which is the, the nodal basin. And then, then it comes down to, you know, why is it that people do better if there are more lymph nodes? And, and you talk, they talked about here inadequate nodal harvest, but then there's really three elements of that. There's the surgical technique, there's the patient's immune system, and then there's the, the pathologist. And so which one of those elements is important? Uh, some people would say, well, it's poor surgery. Others would say that their immune system is poor and therefore they're at a higher risk for recurrence. So you've got those uncertainties, and then you have this sort of relatively low, though higher than we thought, risk of the skip nodes. And then you have higher morbidity with some of the more extended lymphadenectomies, such as, you know, the Japanese do the extended pelvic lymph node dissections where they take the iliac nodes, and there is some additional morbidity. We don't tend to do that here. Also, if you go real high on the inferior mesenteric, then you've got impotence or other issues. And so all those things have to be taken into account, but I think the takeaway that I have is I'm going to keep my eyes open on this. Maybe people will determine that you need to do a different type of resection based on what you find on one of these tests, although it takes longer and it's a mild ex expense, but that we do need to do high ligation in general and get lymph nodes, uh, even, even if we don't know exactly what the benefit of that is, whether it's because like in breast cancer, is it because you're taking the node or is it because you know it's positive? So. The, the, when you say high ligation, keep that. When you say high ligation, <clears throat> explain where, how you go about doing that technically for those of us that haven't done this for a while. So I think um, certainly with the left colon, I think... Mobilize, let's take the right colon. Yes. You mobilize the colon first and then do the high ligation or do the high ligation first? You can, do either, you can do either one and you can do a good job on either one, but I think that the, what needs to happen is you need to really trace the ileal colic all the way back to where there's branches coming off of it. And, and take it 
up high. You don't just go close to the to the bow wall. Now, there's others who would would really mobilize all the way up and get if, determine if there is a right colic, which is only there about 15 percent of the time, and make sure that that's high ligation, and also go up to the middle colic, where you really need to go and identify the pancreas and you know take it really take it up high, and that can be one of the most difficult laparoscopic. Well, do you do that? I, I do that if it's in the uh, if it's up in the hepatic flexure area. Then I'll I'll go up high and really identify the pancreas and and ligate it laparoscopically. You do that. You do that. When the when the patients a hepatic they hepatic them. flexure. Huh? Yeah, when they, they allow me. Sometimes when they allow you. I'm so fat I can't talk okay. About. All right. Okay. Everything that I like. So that's not an ironclad way to go about doing it, then. Well, I think if it's in the hepatic flexure, yeah, you're heading. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, Dr. Greer. <coughs> yeah. I just had a couple of questions. Did you give us a CEA level on this patient? Was it normal? I did not. I did not see one. Okay. Uh, second question is: Had you not taken a lymph node out, the patient probably would not have been given chemotherapy. Yes, sir. And it obviously would adversely affect his long-term survival. So it was a really big deal to find this node. Yeah. Okay. And wouldn't have found it if it hadn't been open, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. What kind of incision did you use? Uh, midline, 14 centimeters. Okay. All right, did you do peritoneal washings for cytology? No. Do you do that with colon cancer? Not that I'm aware of, but I did not know the answer to that. I don't do it unless it, I see, I don't do it unless there's fluid in the pelvis. And okay. if there's fluid in the pelvis, so I'll fluid take in that. the pelvis is the indication. And I would send that. it to cytology, but I would not just wash the abdomen and look for uh, free cells. Okay, no. I think that's a point y'all might want to remember if you discuss a case of uh, on your oral boards. Yeah, Doctor Doctor Moore. Uh, on the ACS service, we usually get these patients when they're perforated or obstructed, and I was just wondering what impact that has on the staging of the patient. I don't know the answer to that. I guess it would still depend on the pathology, like how far it, it's a four. I think a perforation makes it a T4, same with the obstruction, so it ups the ante. Gotcha. What about your relative survival rates? Just a ballpark figure for the students with the different stages. You ran across that. I did not come across that. Uh, basically, though, I did come across if they do not have lymph node metastasis, there's a 70 to 80 percent survival um, if there's no lymph node involvement. So that would be a T or a <coughs> stage two. What What's the anticipated uh, survival now for T4 lesion, with or without chemo? Uh, the T, well, it, it really depends more if it's a stage four. The T the T4. Uh, is going to be, you know, I haven't seen the, as far as, it's, if it's stage two, it's a T4, but a stage two, it's going to have pretty good survival. In fact, some of the larger tumors that are stage two have, have better survival than the smaller tumors. And the thought is that the, it, that indicates tumor biology. If it's been there for a long time and it hasn't become metastatic, it's going to do well. So in that sense, some of the, some of the, the T4 N zeros are, are actually going to do very well. I think some of the issues have to do with margins and local recurrence as far as why you're going to be a little bit more aggressive with the treatment. Well, I mean, the, the reason I wanted to make that point is that at least now this is empiric on my part, but a lot of those smaller but ulcerative lesions ended up having much worse prognosis than big bulky things that even obstructed the colon uh, in my limited experience myself. Uh, and I know <clears throat> uh, from personal experience talking about family members and so forth to people like Ted Copeland and other oncologists, that was their, Hiram Polk and others who, who had dealt with this, that was, that was their similar experience. That a lot of those bulky tumors, well differentiated, don't necessarily metastasize anywhere. And yet they're locally a real big problem. I'm just, I'm just curious if there is a, one size doesn't fit all the biology of the tumor, it's a lot like a breast cancer, is it not? In terms of the biology of the tumor, yeah. So what's the follow-up on this patient? You're the surgeon. Uh, what is your plan? Uh, so the follow-up, um, 
on this patient. I actually got to see him in clinic already. He followed up a week after. He was discharged post-op day seven, uh, followed up with us a week later, um, was doing well, had his you know, staples removed and all that. Um, and so uh, made sure he was in with medical oncology. Um, he's going to receive three months of chemo with them. Um, and then I would say, you know, continued surveillance. We'll need colonoscopy uh, at six months or a year and then continue to for colonoscopies, uh, depending on what you see on them. Um, and then every, I guess, three years, three to five. C years. CEA part of the process CEA now? should be part of the process, yes, sir. So how often? I guess I would check it yearly. Okay, Tyler, you ready to go? Morning. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Tyler Kester. I'm one of the fourth year um, uh, residents. I want to thank Dr. Maxwell uh, for uh, letting me present this patient. Uh, I have it titled An Interesting Case of Necrotizing Pancreatitis, but I guess uh, for people that have been on the ACS service and the um, Surgical Critical Care Service, maybe another name would be another case of a necrotizing pancreatitis. We seem to have quite a few of these recently. So I don't have any disclosures. Uh, this is a basic outline. Uh, we're going to do a case presentation, uh, then go through the historical perspective, uh, a new classification system, and current practices and recent literature. So our patient is a 67-year-old male. He was previously seen uh, beginning of February at an outside hospital and diagnosed with um, acute uh, pancreatitis from a biliary source. Uh, he was treated with an ERCP and a stent at that time. Uh, approximately a week later, he represented to Erlanger, uh, now with abdominal pain and uh, uh, necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, this is his past medical history and surgical history and his labs on arrival as well as his vitals. Uh, you'll note that he does have a leukocytosis and an anemia, but otherwise uh, labs are fairly normal with a normal uh, total bilirubin and lipase. This is his CT scan when he presented, so if we look here, for the medical students, this is a fluid collection around his pancreas. Um, he's got a large amount of edema in his pancreas as well. And then you have his biliary stent uh, right there. Um, <clears throat> he was um, whoops, admitted to the ICU uh, and a post pyloric uh, dop off tube was placed. Uh, he's treated with medical management uh, for approximately a week. Uh, at about a week's time, he had a, a worsening leukocytosis and abdominal pain. Uh, so he received another CT scan at that time, uh, which is shown here. And you can see that he's got more fluid in his abdomen. And then uh, if you look at his pancreas here, he's now got air in these fluid collections. Uh, very concerning for uh, an infectious process. So he was started on uh, antibiotics and uh, was uh, continue to be monitored in the ICU. Uh, approximately three days later, he had worsening abdominal pain and acute onset of uh, hypotension and decreased urinary output. Um, it was determined uh, that he had abdominal compartment syndrome and he was taken to the OR uh, fairly urgently for an exploratory laparotomy and a cystogastrostomy, uh, taken back to the ICU post-op. Uh, in the ICU, uh, the following day, he had a change in the color of his uh, vac output, um, so it was taken back to the operating room. Uh, there he's noted to have a hole in the mesocolon uh, through which the pseudocyst had eroded. A uh, mental patch was placed at this time. Uh, he, over the next two days, then went uh, again for uh, a debridement of the pancreas and also an open cholecystectomy. Uh, the night of the March 2nd, um, while in the ICU, he uh, had a very quick onset of uh, hypotension and tachycardia. Uh, shortly thereafter, he had uh, massive amounts of um, emesis of bright red blood. Uh, he was taken to uh, interventional radiology uh, for an angiogram. Here you can see his aorta, and you have renals coming off, uh, SMA, and then the celiac trunk here. So as we start to go through it, they'll um, focus in on the celiac trunk, and then this is his splenic artery coming off here, and this is uh, extra of uh, contrast. Uh, interventional radiologist attempted uh, to uh, get a wire across the 
area that was bleeding, but they were unable to. Um, so we put up a Reboa catheter, uh, took him to the operating room uh, for uh, emergent uh, ligation of a splenic artery as well as a splenectomy and a gastrophy of uh, his previous uh, cyst gastrostomy. Um, over the next two days, he uh, returned to the operating room several more times. Uh, because of his hypotension, his uh, colon had become ischemic and he required a subtotal colectomy. Um, on the uh, following day, while uh, looking at his pancreatic bed, we noted that he had a tube sticking out of uh, his common bile duct, which was his previously placed stent. So he had a T-tube uh, placed in the bile duct. He also had ischemic duodenum. Uh, we put a malincot in that for uh, tube duodenostomy um, and took him back to the ICU for further resuscitation. Two days later, he was taken back. Uh, again, he had a antrectomy, a total duodenectomy, a creation of ileostomy and a tracheostomy. Again, he was resuscitated in the ICU following that uh, and then was taken for hepaticojejunostomy and a gastrojejunostomy. Um, he currently remains in the ICU, uh, GCS of 11T. He's having good ostomy output, um, is weaning down on his pressors on just a small amount of levofed. Uh, the plan is to go back to the OR today and uh, examine uh, his abdomen um, and uh, look at the potential for uh, plant ventral hernia. Does he have a, have a backpack on now then, Tom? Yes, sir, he does. Okay, thanks. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to go kind of through the historical perspective of acute pancreatitis. Um, I know when I was in med school at UT, uh, they showed this uh, painting to me very early on. It's a painting that was done in uh, 1632 by Rembrandt. It's entitled um, The Anatomy Lesson by uh, Nicholas Tulp. Um, Nicholas Tulp later in uh, 1652 would uh, be one of the first to uh, describe um, acute pancreatitis. Uh, he wrote a book uh, entitled Medical Observations, which later got the nickname uh, Book of Monsters. Uh, he would uh, take animals that were uh, coming from the uh, trading companies and dissect them and uh, would have uh, pictures of their dissections as well as uh, patients that he treated in that book and one of his patients was a young man that presented with severe abdominal pain that got worse and had uh, fevers and on autopsy he had a pancreas that was full of uh, purulence. About a hundred years later in 1761 Morgagni uh, would write a book called The Seat and Cause of Disease Investigation by Anatomy uh, where he would describe uh, pancreatic pseudocyst for the first time. It would be another hundred years until uh, the um, uh, a real understanding of acute pancreatitis would uh, start. Uh, Dr. Fitz, a physician in Boston, would uh, do the first paper uh, talking about acute pancreatitis and the treatments. And Dr. Sen, uh, a, a colleague at that time, uh, surgeon that uh, came from uh, Sweden would uh, describe uh, early techniques in uh, treating um, pancreatitis uh, surgically. With the onset of World War I and a uh, decrease in resources and an increase in starvation, uh, there was a sharp decline in the amount of surgeries done for acute pancreatitis, uh, so much so that uh, people began to study it. Paxton and Payne did a study of 300 patients and found that uh, patients actually treated conservatively had a better outcome than uh, patients treated with uh, surgery. Uh, after World War I, uh, there was a secondary spike in operative treatments, and this trend continued uh, until the late 1990s, 2000s. In 1992, uh, there was a meeting in Atlanta uh, to uh, come up with a classification for acute pancreatitis. and. Um, uh, the fluid collections that uh, would form. Uh, this was later revised in 2012. This is the revised Atlanta classification system. Uh, what you'll notice is it's kind of divided into um, two times and uh, two uh, uh, descriptions of the pancreas. So you have uh, edematous pancreas and then you have a necrotizing pan uh, pancreatitis and you have early onset which is less than four weeks and late which is greater than four weeks and each of these uh, when you see a collection uh, has a name, uh, the ones that we'll ta be talking about most for this will be uh, Waldorf necrosis, which is a late um, pancreatitis uh, that is necrotizing, and pancreatic pseudocyst, which is uh, not a necrotizing and is also a late. Uh, at that conference, they also talked about uh, when to intervene uh, for these patients. Um, so in the acute um, 
phase, less than four weeks, and you have a sterile acute necrotic collection, there's really no uh, early intervention necessary. Um, and uh, as long as it remains sterile, intervention is only uh, late in the course. Uh, in terms of an affected acute necrotic collection, uh, it's most beneficial to try to uh, wait at least three weeks before uh, operating on these uh, patients. Um, but uh, sometimes early intervention is required uh, if this patient develops uh, septic shock or decompensates or has uh, signs or symptoms of abdominal compartment syndrome. Patients with a uh, walled-off necrosis, if they're asymptomatic, uh, literature would say that uh, there's really no in intervention needed. Um, if they are symptomatic, if they have gastric outlet obstruction or belly obstruction uh, or pain, uh, the ideal time is to wait greater than four weeks. So how to intervene? Um, <clears throat> historically, uh, the treatment for acute uh, necrotizing pancreatitis was an open operation, whether that be a laparotomy or a retroperitoneal flank concision uh, with ne necrosectomy and drainage or packing. Um, this carried a very high morbidity and mortality. Um, and this was kind of the standard operation up until the 1990s. If it was a walled off, uh, necrosis or a pancreatic pseudocyst, you had uh, some other options. Um, uh, one of the options would be a uh, cyst gastrostomy, which is shown here. This is a transgastric cyst gastrostomy, so a incision is made in the uh, anterior wall of the stomach. The um, pseudocyst or Waldorf necrosis uh, is found with uh, aspiration. Uh, it's then entered and a cyst gastrostomy is uh, created, um, and then the anterior stomach wall is uh, reapproximated. And this works really well for uh, cysts that abut uh, the, the body of the stomach. Uh, cysts can also occur uh, elsewhere, so if they're near the head of the pancreas, you can use the duodenum as a conduit um, and do a, a similar approach. If they're uh, lower uh, or along the um, uh, colic gutters, you can do a cyst, uh, 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 cystojugenostomy. Uh, with a Ruin Y uh, anastomosis here. Um, open treatment of Waldorf necrosis and pancreatic pseudocysts have been studied pretty extensively. Uh, they carry a, a lower mortality and complication rate than uh, the open necrosectomy, uh, with a mortality of about 5.8 and a complication rate of uh, 24%. As um, technology advanced and uh, laparoscopic uh, procedures became more common, uh, Physicians tried uh, laparoscopic necrosectomies. Uh, several papers uh, came out trying to describe these, and um, the consensus was that they were better than an open uh, necrosectomy, but they still carried a very high morbidity and mortality um, and need for reoperation and conversion to open procedure. Uh, what did change is uh, uh, with Waldorf necrosis or um, pancreatic pseudocyst, uh, laparoscopic drainage, uh, either through a transgastric, um, where you would make an incision on the interior abdominal or interior wall of the stomach, or intraluminal, where you would use uh, balloon uh, trocars to uh, go inside the stomach and hold the stomach up, um, had good uh, mortality and low complication rates. Uh, there's not large studies, but there are a large number of small studies, um, and you can see that their mortality is very low and their complication rates are, are very low as well. Uh, while all this was happening, CT scanners were becoming uh, better and um, percutaneous drains were starting to become popular. Uh, so uh, in 2010, a um, study out of uh, Denmark uh, was uh, produced as a step-up approach versus an uh, open necrosectomy. For those that don't know, the step-up approach would be placement of a percutaneous catheter uh, into the necrotic fluid collection, uh, followed by upsizings of this catheter uh, until the point where you can, uh, if necessary, either remove the necrosis um, directly with direct vision or uh, insert a video scope to remove the necrotic tissue there. This is a pretty small study, is 88 patients. Uh, their primary endpoint was uh, major complications. 69% of the patients with open uh, procedures had major complications as opposed to 40% with uh, the step-up patients. 35% uh, of the patients uh, in the step-up group only required the percutaneous drainage and did not require any retroperitoneal uh, debridement. Uh, multiple organ failure and new onset diabetes were both less in the step-up versus the open, and there was a trend towards uh, 
decreased rate of death in the step up versus the open, but um, because of the small number of patients, this was not statistically significant. Um, while laparoscopic approaches were uh, becoming popular, endoscopy was becoming popular well as well. Um, in 1985, uh, the first drainage of a pancreatic pseudocyst was done through the papilla. Uh, ten years later, uh, the first uh, irrigation of a Waldorf necrosis uh, through a naso uh, cyst tube was uh, done uh, by Dr. Barron. And then four years later, the first endoscopic necrosectomy was done. The first use of endoscopy was mostly for pancreatic pseudocysts, uh, where there was no uh, necrotic tissue. Uh, scope was inserted into the stomach. Uh, a, a needle was used to aspirate the fluid, and a wire was passed. Uh, the tract was then dilated, and uh, pigtail stents could be placed, as well as a, a rinsing catheter that came out through the nose. Um, this uh, has been studied pretty extensively, um, 182 papers that all look at this, and they have good success rates. Technically, uh, their success rates are 89 to 100%, with treatment rates of 82 to 100%. Mortality is low, complications are low, and recurrence rates are fairly low as well. When it comes to necrotic Waldorf uh, collections, uh, endoscopy has a role as well. Uh, you can. Uh, place an endoscope and uh, place a wire into the necrotic cavity and then uh, place a, um, uh, a sheath in order to uh, debride the necrotic uh, tissue. Um, and these are some pictures here. These are several different stents. This is bare metal stent. They have covered stents as well. And you can see that there's a connection here between the stent and the uh, necrotic tissue. Um, several different stents that are available up here. Uh, these are bare metal stents. These are all, uh, this one is a covered stent. Um, in the recent years, it's been studied pretty extensively as well. Um, they have complete resolution of the collections in 76% of the patients, a low mortality rate, a fairly low morbidity rate, and then a complication rate uh, that uh, is seen there. About 10% of these patients will require surgery or repeat uh, procedures in order to uh, treat their uh, Waldorf necrosis. The uh, endoscopic treatment, since it has gotten so uh, popular, um, is being done more often. Uh, it does um, lend itself to a significant bias when you're reading these studies. Uh, when you read about their low complication rates and their high success rates, um, they often uh, leave out that they uh, are not treating septic patients, that they're not treating um, cysts that are, are further away than one to two centimeters, uh, that these patients um, don't have any signs of abdominal compartment syndrome. And then these uh, centers are, are uh, very specific. They have endoscopists that do this quite often. So some conclusions. Uh, treatment of Waldorf necrosis and uh, pancreatic uh, pseudocysts is an evolving field. Endoscopy is becoming uh, more advanced uh, and is more applicable in draining uh, easy to reach uh, pseudocyst and Waldorf necrosis. Uh, for those that are not as easy to reach, uh, laparoscopic transgastric and interluminal cyst gastrostomies uh, still have a good uh, patency rate, a good um, uh, treatment rate, and a low complication rate. And uh, infected acute necrotic collections uh, carry a high rate of mortality and morbidity. Uh, these uh, can be drained, uh, started with the uh, step-up procedure, uh, and then uh, with an open uh, cystoenterostomy and an open uh, necrosectomy as a last resort since it has a high mortality and morbidity. For cost of medicine, uh, this is one of the stents. This is a Boston Sci Scientific Axio stent. Uh, the cost of the stent itself and the deployment uh, mechanism is $799. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Covered a lot in a short time there. Uh, questions, comments uh, that people want to make. Well, um, this patient, when it came in, uh, could you have uh, predicted, uh, based on the clinical presentation, that he's going to end up where he is now? No, he came in with a uh, sterile, um, at least on CT scan, a, a sterile fluid collection, about. Uh, 8 to 12 percent of these get infected and so if you can uh, get him through to four weeks when the pseudocapsule is a lot uh, tougher then he'll have a better outcome and 
So that's what, what the plan was. So, when it so came you in. saw the evolution of the pathophysiology of pancreatitis in here, right? Because he came in not that sick. With a lot of not, he did not have a lot of bad ransom signs or anything like that. It didn't look like, right? I mean, I, your lab work wasn't up for very long, but things looked pretty good. Bilirubin was normal. So Bilirubin was normal. Amylase was normal. Yeah. Okay. Slight anemia. So he, he got sicker as time went by, just a little bit at a time. Did you, uh, yes, sir. You, did you get a chance to see him the whole time? For the uh, no, I saw him after his first operation. Okay. So you you didn't get to see that part of it. Yes. I just have a question. There are so many different types of interventions that you can do for this, and um, my question is pertaining to the boards and to our attendings on how to answer um, questions regarding um, infected necrotic pancreatitis in <clears throat> um, a patient, you know, in multiple different situations, but someone who's stable, unstable, because previously it was open necrosectomy, but now it looks like that you don't ever want to operate on them unless you absolutely have to. I don't think that's true, but you want you want to address that? that I'll try to address that in some of my comments. So um, you're right, this was an awful lot to cover, uh, but the trajectory of this case uh, crossing just about every complication known to necrotizing pancreatitis, uh, we decided to, to talk about it because there is a lot of new literature uh, evolving on this. And I think uh, your answer, if you're ever given this in a board situation, is to be able to explain, uh, you know, whatever methodology you're most uh, comfortable with. And I think uh, talking about an open uh, pancreatic necrosectomy, a traditional open necrosectomy, if you know how to describe it and talk about how to drain it, that's fine. I think probably the most popular uh, way in the literature when you go to the meetings uh, talking to people that are recruiting these patients, uh, it's the step up procedure, put a lateral drain in them, uh, try and stabilize somebody who is becoming septic from infecting uh, the walled off pancreatic necrosis and like he showed, I think it's pretty clear, third uh, patients will respond to that alone and not need any further surgical intervention. Most of them in our experience wind up needing to have the tract dilated and there's a variety of techniques so either going in laparoscopically or a hybrid technique where you wind up with a five or six centimeter flank incision and you use a wound protector and a laparoscope and a sponge stick to go in there and try and de to debreed. Uh, and that's what we've most commonly been doing here uh, and before I go on, I want to say one other I thing that uh, I think the, the mystery uh, uh, or the practice of giving prophylactic antibiotics for uh, walled off pancreatic necrosis has uh, finally been debunked. I think collectively here, we all agree that we don't give prophylactic antibiotics anymore. Uh, so in this particular patient, that is something that you should, for oral boards, I think, know at least the answer to. There might be a time to use them, but you want to know that it's not standard of care to do prophylactic antibiotics because that's a that's that's an argument that's raged for 30 years. When yeah, you know, when I was a resident, uh, there was a lot of drug companies out there beating that down. You got to put oh, them yeah. on prophylactic antibiotics. It reduces mortality, and there's been a number of meta-analyses now that show that that is not the case. So we don't give prophylactic antibiotics for necrotizing pancreatitis. So uh, um, went to the uh, AAST. They had a nice session on management of uh, uh, pancreatic necrosis. And uh, there's an, uh, an emerging uh, literature on doing a cyst gastrostomy acutely. Uh, people are talking about it two weeks. Traditionally, we would wait six to eight uh, weeks minimum to, to do a cyst gastrostomy, but there was a lot of data at the meeting. UCLA um, and Calgary uh, have uh, multi center. Uh, 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 study where they're looking at the step-up procedure and doing acute cyst gastrostomies, and you know I was well, afraid. Are you doing both the step-up and the cyst gastrostomy? No, either either one. Either one, okay, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, <laughs> and case wouldn't work out too well. Northwestern, yeah, uh, is also 
contributing patients to this data pool. And so the, um, they had a number of great case presentations and the guy said, you know, first couple of these, you ought to do them open. When you get more comfortable with it, you know, try and do them laparoscopic. So this, if you can go back to the CAT scan, uh, Tyler, when he was infected, uh, uh, this seemed like the best application you were going to find for doing it. He was about a month out at, at this point, actually. It wasn't really acute, but we thought we had a, a case that that would work. What happened with him was we had put the Dobhoff down, we were feeding him, he was completely stable, and then Friday he started looking a little septic. We repeated the CAT scan, he had the air, told him to put him on antibiotics, came back in on call Sunday and he was crashing through the floorboards and had obvious uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, so it was a no-brainer, go for a laparotomy. Seemed like that would be a perfect application of a cis-gastrostomy. It looked like that pseudocyst had a decent rind around it. Uh, and so that's what we did. He had a m bunch of inner loop abscesses that that's what was causing the abdominal compartment syndrome. I think there was a microscopic leak from the, uh, the fluid retroperitoneal fluid collection that had seeded the rest of the abdomen and that was causing the abdominal compartment syndrome. We washed all that out. He stabilized. We did the cisgastrostomy, pulled some big chunks of necrotic tissue out of the retroperitoneum. Uh, felt pretty good about the procedure. He was too distended to close his abdomen from the compartment syndrome. Uh, next day he had what looked like bilious drainage in his backpack. We thought he had perforated something and took him back and he had eroded through the transverse mesocolon mesentery and was just draining uh, all of his uh, retroperitoneal contents through the mesocolon into the lower abdomen. And at that point, we could look into oh, the lesser... Oh, he didn't have a hole in the colon, though? No, okay. not at that point. Okay. All the bowel was intact, actually healthy. And so at that point, we actually did some debridement through the mesocolon because we had a different angle and visualization through that. And we pulled some more chunks of dead tissue out of there and got it bleeding pretty good, uh, packed them off, took them back to the ICU, waited a, two days, took them back again, took the packs out, thought we had completed our debridement, did like a gram patch repair of the colonic mesentery, put a bunch of fiber and glue on it, seemed to work pretty good. And then his next complication was he eroded his uh, splenic artery, developed a pseudoaneurysm. Uh, Quafford told us it was right at the celiac trunk and he couldn't do anything about it, so he put a Reboa up took him emergently to the operating room. At that point, our only option was to open the lesser sac. We delved right into the lesser sac and found a proximal pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. We ligated, did some more debridement. It's amazing how much necrotic material is in a patient like this. Um, and took him back the next day and his colon was dead. So they took his colon out, Dr. Mejia took him back that day. And uh, so now we've got a patient that had a cystgastrostomy with a hole in the posterior stomach that we oversewed with a stapler and just, just total disaster. So he had necrosed the head of his pancreas and you could see the portal vein, the SV splenic vein confluence, it was green we're just waiting for that to blow out. The, you can see the superior and inferior pancreatoduodenals, they were thrombosed. The head of the pancreas was basically gone. And we could see the, sit, the stent in the bile duct. The bile duct had eroded, the duodenum had eroded. So we wound up doing a, tried to resect from the posterior gastrostomy staple line, the, uh, all the entire duodenum and when we the amazing thing to me, after all the debridement he had had, when we dunked the duodenum underneath the SMA, another chunk of necrotic material the size of your hand fell out of there. We thought we had cleaned everything up and there was still more dead tissue. So now we got him reconstructed with an open abdomen and we're trying to get him to heal. So it's been a... Go to your way. picture of it that shows the, the jejunostomy, pancreatical jejunostomy, if you will. 
just we, we are out of time, but I do want to make a couple of points. One thing I want to ask you about is what happens. Go ahead when you get there. I'd love that I have a picture of a pancreatic. Yeah, you do. You got you got a diagram, not a picture of the, of the operation. You got the the loop going the the, the rewire limb going up to the pancreas. There you go. What happens to that when it seals? What happens to the jejunum? Because you're going, you're draining the cyst there, right? Yes, sir. Uh, just I'm not sure I know the answer. I'm just asking you. I mean, you got the bowel hooked up to the pancreas. You're going, to, you're just draining the necrotic tissue, and the patient gets well and everything's good. What happens? It seals off. It, it you know, it just, and that's why you do it a rewire. But it'll seal on its own, and you've just got a, a blind loop of the small bowel. You know, or if they have a major pancreatic duct disruption and they have a pancreatic well, fistula, right. it I mean, drains. But they've got drainage, but, if it, but once, once they become normal, if they do, then you know it just it just atrophies and it's not a problem. I mean, the, the anastomosis does. Uh, I, I think that's the answer. Um, the answer to your question, Dr. Zug, is this is one of those times where do not make up an operation. Okay, don't make up something you haven't seen done. Don't make up, uh, you know, I've read about a step-up procedure and then them ask you how to do it. What you've seen is an open neck resectomy. And while you understand there are other ways to do this, you're more comfortable with an open neck resectomy and drainage. Now go to your step-up. Because the one thing that's, that's, that really is good about the step-up is that the drain is, po is posterior to the colon. Because the worst thing, if, if you, of course you had every disaster here, but the worst thing you run into these is a colon leak from your drain. And so if on that first operation, if you do that necrosectomy, get the valve down gently, Met, uh, the, the transverse colon, especially the, 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 uh, the splenic flexor, and put the drain posterior to it. And that's what the step-up allows you to do if you look at that transverse cut there, and you're behind the colon. Uh, so I think those are just a few technical things that, that some of us who've done these things uh, would know. For the benefit of the medical students, because many of you will become primary care doctors, we know, this is an example of why if a patient has gallstones, whether they're symptomatic or not, just think about whether or not they need to get the gallbladder out. Because I understand that the, the basis for his pancreatitis was gallbladder disease, right? Right. He had these tiny little stones. So if he had had an elective cholecystectomy a year ago or six months ago or something like that, then he wouldn't be about to die, maybe. Uh, and so while the incidence of that occurring is not that high when it happens. If it happens to you, it's terrible. Uh, so. What was the culture? E. coli. E. coli. The, okay, yes, the, I'm sorry, Dr. Giles. No, I just had a couple of quick uh, finishing oh, announcements. For, oh, you want points for this? Uh, no, no, and it's not about this, so if anybody okay. else has got anything about that. Two great I, cases, well done, yeah, thank very, you. Very, very good. A um, couple of quick things for residency related. Uh, number one, um, Kevin, Harold, Harold? Yeah, you're here. Um, so is there a consult note? So I know you can type, you know, dot UT surge and it pulls up an HMP. Is there one for consult? No, but it would be fine to make one. Okay, we need to make one because I got two more emails yesterday, nasty emails from Erlanger about the fact that we're 